From its humble beginning to the stuttering steps of the pulp era, science fiction had grown from an obscure subgenre into an emerging cultural force. Now, it's time for it to take center stage. Fiction defines culture. Culture defines fiction. The cycle continues forever. The Golden Age began in the fires of the Second World War. It ushered in the Space Age, and it came to an end in a world which could no longer deny that it staggered on the precipice of nuclear annihilation. Different people date the Golden Age of science fiction differently. Some say it began in 1938, when Campbell took the helm of Astounding Stories, while others say it didn't end until 1963, when Michael Moorcock became the editor of New Worlds. But we're not going to worry about that sort of rigid structure, because we're going to be far more concerned with an ethos, a worldview that tied all of the golden age of science fiction together. Because golden age science fiction came out of an American understanding of the world that was born in World War II. This vision came from a victorious America that believed the American way had triumphed and had been proven conclusively right. In doing so, it highlighted some of the greatest strengths of the American system, while at the same time falling prey to the same blind spots that very system creates. It was filled with all of the odd idiosyncrasies and contradictions in the American psyche of the period. It showed a love for individual freedom and military hierarchy, of democracies ruled by men of action who didn't listen to what anyone said, of bringing American virtues to other civilizations without really stopping to think if they'd asked for it. Trade, capitalism, and the free flow of commerce will play a big part in these stories. It's here that we get the romanticized space trader, roguish, out in the unknown, trying to turn a profit a few parsecs past the reach of the law. It's here, too, that corporations and corporate concerns start to creep into science fiction, from U.S. robotics and mechanical men to the amusingly wacky Magic Inc. The Golden Age also brings with it a truer focus on science, abandoning some of the slipshod science writing of the pulp era. It enshrines science and engineering as the solution to every problem. Quick action, technical know-how, and clever jerry-rigging almost always save the day, leaving little room for well-rounded characters finding subtle, human answers to what confronts them. The Golden Age argued for a liberation from the past, for an escape from superstition and religion, to break the shackles of tradition and truly walk free into the era of rationality. Unfortunately, many of the Golden Age authors weren't cognizant of what worldviews, ideologies, and biases they carried with them. So I'll give you three guesses as to the gender of most protagonists in these books. Don't worry, I'll wait. You guessed it, Zoe. They were male. And while the men argue loudly for personal freedom or total liberation, the non-male characters tend to exist only to support these men. Or, more tragically still, as an object for the liberated man to do with as he pleases and then discard to demonstrate that he's not bound by traditional morality. Even the most rational women in these novels are often shown overcome by emotions or in hysterics in ways that men are not. Though to give credit where credit is due, this is also the period where we start to see women as engineers and scientists rather than only wives and mothers, even if those roles are often in service to the men. But in the history of sci-fi, this was also the period where sci-fi grew up. New science fiction magazines began hitting the scene, so the genre wasn't totally dominated by astounding stories. Worldcon, the first major science fiction convention, and where the Hugo Awards are chosen to this day, was established. The idea of the fix-up, taking a group of already published short stories, tying them together with a narrative wrapper, and publishing them as a novel, came into being. This allowed far more people to get access to short stories and fix-ups, like iRobot or The Martian Chronicles. But perhaps the largest change was the growing up itself. Campbell's idea-centric sci-fi meant science fiction was no longer just aimed at children and teens. Rather, it became a tool to explore concepts and play with philosophy in a way science fiction hadn't been since the days of the Forgotten Foundations. This time, though, it was for a mass audience. And as part of this new idea-centric approach, the Golden Age laid down most of the fundamental concepts in science fiction, the ideas that still dominate sci-fi today. Semi-feudal interstellar empires, future histories which span not hundreds or thousands of years, but hundreds or thousands of millennia, robots working around their programming, temporal paradoxes, and the effects of vastly extended human lifespans, they were all established as pillars of science fiction in this period. More than that, though, the way we think about these ideas in science fiction all the way up to today was created and solidified by those Golden Age authors. Even now, many of our new takes on these themes are simply subversions of that Golden Age thinking, 
That is, of course, when we get any new takes at all. And many of these ideas were first brought to us by the three men that dominated the Golden Age. Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Arthur C. Clarke. Their influence over modern science fiction and their importance in bringing science fiction into the modern age cannot be overstated. So for the next several episodes, we'll be looking at these three men and their careers. We'll span the full scope of what they did, even when their work continued past what's traditionally considered the Golden Age, so we can talk about them holistically. Because these men defined the Golden Age, and the Golden Age defined them. We'll pick that up next time.